And, and our second RES fellow this afternoon, who is also funded from 2012 to 2015, is Nick Wright from Keel University. And when he's managed to plug his computer in, he's going to talk to us about the dynamics of star clusters. <coughs> All right. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start actually by thanking the Royal Astronomical Society for funding me for three years, um, which was uh, really invaluable for my career. Um, uh, I think it's a really excellent scheme that they've had going, very useful for young uh, astronomers uh, working in the UK. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the dynamics of star clusters. Uh, this is work I did at Hertfordshire University for three years, um, and I'm now at, at Keele University. Uh, there's a number of people who've contributed to this work uh, who are listed here, so I'd like to thank uh, all those people for all the work they've done towards this. I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction to star formation and star clusters. Um, in particular looking at their dynamics, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that various people have done over the last few years um, using kinematic measurements to study uh, star formation and star clusters. Um, and then by, by way of a sort of preview of what we might get from Gaia, I'm going to give an example of a piece of work that I've done over the last two or three years, which I think provides some interesting insights. And moving forward. No, we're doing it the old-fashioned way. Right, I'm going to start with quite a bold statement that star formation is probably the most important process in the entire universe. And I say that because of how many other astrophysical processes it influences and is important for. It's obviously important for understanding how stars form and the distribution of stellar masses that come out of the star formation process, the initial mass function. Uh, and by doing so, it's also therefore important for the different types of star which populate galaxies, i.e. low mass stars and high mass stars. And they influence galaxies in different ways. High mass stars exert a considerable feedback on their environment through ultraviolet radiation, stellar winds, supernovae explosion. That effectively controls the energy budget throughout most of galaxies. It also dictates the visible structure of galaxies uh, in, in terms of their spiral arm structure, where the young stars are forming. And stars of different masses also are responsible for replenishing the interstellar medium with chemical elements in different ways. So star formation is effectively setting the chemical evolution of galaxies as well. On top of all that, star formation is obviously very important for the formation of planetary systems. And that's kind of obvious because we believe planetary systems form around very recently formed stars. Stars that are actually still in the process of contracting onto the main sequence are still probably in their birth environment. And so the formation of the star and the process that goes on leading to that star plays an important role in the formation of the planetary system around that star. Now, stars don't form in isolation, they form in groups. Uh, we know this because the vast majority of young stars that we observe are found in groups or clusters of some sort. Here are some examples from within our own galaxy, um, covering a wide range of scales. This is a sort of typical low mass region, this is the Rorofuki region, about 100 solar masses of stars there. Nothing much more massive is going to form there than our sun. Um, not particularly high density, um, a very quiescent region for young stars to form in. If you go up an order of magnitude in scale to a region like the Orion Nebula Cluster, you've got an example of where high mass stars are forming, O-type stars that are capable of ionizing their circumstellar environment. The densities get higher here as well. We've got about 1,000 stars per cubic parsec in the center of the Orion Nebula Cluster. But even within our galaxy, you'll find even more massive clusters. This is NGC 3603. It's a few times 10 to the 4 solar masses of stars in there with a central density of about 10 to the 4 stars per cubic parsec. It's a very different environment in here to in here. You've got tens or hundreds of O-type stars in this environment and weird exotic things forming as those stars come to the ends of their lives. And those high stellar densities are also going to play a role in the star formation process. In fact, there is a wide range of implications um, for clustering in terms of how we understand star formation. One of the theories of how high mass stars form, which is known as competitive accretion, suggests that the gravitational potential caused by a cluster of stars is in some way able to assist the flow of material from the surrounding molecular cloud onto stars, and in particular onto the stars that sit at the centres of those gravitational potentials, therefore allowing those stars to accrete the most mass and potentially become the most massive stars. So in that context, clusters are important for forming high mass stars. Clustering is also very important for the evolution of protoplanetary disks. In environments such as this, close encounters are very common, and there is evidence that close encounters between stars are able to truncate protoplanetary disks, reducing their radii, <coughs> shedding material from them. We know, for example, from observations of the Orion Nebula Cluster from proplids 
such as this artist's impression here, that the ultraviolet radiation that comes from massive stars is also capable of evaporating material from protoplanetary disks. So an environment like this is going to be very different to an environment like this when it comes to forming and the early evolution of protoplanetary disks. And finally, we also use star clusters as astrophysical tools. We use them to study star formation in distant galaxies, to understand the star formation history of galaxies, and we also use them as simple stellar populations to study the evolution of stars, and very soon I expect we'll be using them to study the evolution of planetary systems. And so if we're to use star clusters as astrophysical tools in that way, we really need to understand how star clusters form and how they evolve and uh, dynamically perhaps disrupt. Um, now most of our understanding of this of star clusters, of their dynamical evolution and their structure has come from structural studies over the last few decades or more. But we're actually coming to a time where there is coming a re revolution in kinematic data quality and quantity, um, which is driven by two things. The first is an increase in the number of multi-object spectroscopic surveys that are providing us with radial velocities for tens or hundreds of thousands of young stars in star-forming regions and star clusters. One of the most prominent of these is the Gairiso survey, which has had 300 nights on the VLT flames instrument. You can see that here. Um, but SDSS has also got a near-infrared spectroscopic survey called InSync, and in the next few years we'll see other facilities such as WEAVE on the WHT and Foremost on VISTA. All of these are targeting young stars in clusters, uh, in, the, in the field, in star-forming regions, and are informing us of their kinematics. This data is also going to be complemented very soon by data from Gaia. Now Gaia, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is ESA's current flagship mission. It's an astrometric satellite and that means it measures the positions of stars. But it does so very precisely and repeatedly, typically 70 times over the five-year mission of the satellite. And by repeatedly measuring the positions of stars, it not only knows where they are, but it knows their proper motion across the plane of the sky and it knows their parallax and so you can get estimates of their distances. And Gaia will do that for the billion brightest stars in the sky, which it stretches all the way to out to uh, some other galaxies in the local group. But that will revolutionise our view of not only our galaxy, but star clusters and star formation uh, in star-forming regions. So from these two sort of facilities, we can actually get six-dimensional phase space information for tens or hundreds of thousands of young stars. What sort of thing can we learn from this information? I'd like to give a couple of examples here. These are from two studies, um, one of NGC 1333 and another of Yuki. These are both relatively low mass regions. Uh, one study is from the InSync survey and the other from the Gaia Riso survey. Both of these have measured the radial velocities of stars in the star forming regions which are a few million years old and they found them to be in viral equilibrium, i.e. their velocities are consistent with what would be expected if they were gravitationally bound based upon the mass of material that's there. Other studies, however, of younger stars, pre-stellar cores, in these regions have found that those cores are actually subvirial, i.e. the stars are not moving fast enough to stay in, a, in their current state um, in the potential in which they sit, and they're in the process of presumably collapsing to form a group. And one of the implications, or one of the ideas to explain this that some people have considered, is that stars are actually born potentially in a subvirial state within the star forming region that they're in, this might come out of, for example, uh, magnetic drag or various processes within the star-forming region. Uh, this subvirial state that they're born in effectively leads them to collapse to form a cluster, allowing stars to transition perhaps from a very fractal distribution, perhaps following the filaments within molecular clouds, into a more dense and centrally concentrated cluster. That's just one in interpretation of that. Radial velocity measurements of um, star clusters and star forming regions have also shown us that there's a lot more structure within the regions that we're studying. This is, again, two studies um, from the Gaia Riso survey, a study of Gamma 2 Valorum by Jeffries et al., and a study of NGC 2264 by Tobin et al. Um, both of these studies have found that there is a lot more structure within the distribution of stars in phase space than we knew of from just their physical structure. For example, Tobin et al. here, they're showing the radial velocity at various different slices in declination and seeing that the radial velocity distribution varies as you take different slices um, through, through NGC 2264. Jeffries et al. are showing the radial velocity distribution here of one sight line towards the Gamma 2 Valorum Association. And as you can see, they found evidence that there appears to be two components there, this 
narrow component, probably indicating a gravitationally bound system, most likely a small compact cluster, and this broader distribution here, which indicates an unbound system, probably something like an association. The fact that these two are actually projected onto each other and can't be separated spatially um, means that it's only from the kinematic information that we can begin to see that substructure. Now, uh, one of the things that radio velocities can't give us, unfortunately, is an idea of the physical processes that are actually causing the motions that we see. And the reason for this is because they probe a dimension that we don't have spatial information for. We don't have line of sight distance necessary to tell us whether stars are on the near or far side of a star forming region. So if we see that a star is moving away from us or towards us relative to the bulk motion, we don't know whether it's moving away from us because the cluster is expanding or whether it's contracting. Um, and of course, because we don't have plane of the sky motions for most stars at the moment, we can't do that based upon um, plane of the sky structure. Now, Qatar et al. have actually found a very interesting way around this, and they're doing this by using extinction as a proxy for distance. Now, if you're looking down a narrow enough sight line and you're looking through a star-forming region, it's a relatively reasonable assumption that as you go through the molecular cloud, stars that are more extinguished are further away. Now, obviously, there's going to be some variation in that, so it's not a perfect relationship. But it's an interesting way, I think, to get an, an estimate of distance from extinction. And what they claim to have found is that there is a correlation between extinction, sorry, between, uh, what, between extinction and velocity, suggesting that the stars are sort of converging along the line of sight, i.e. that this group of stars is in the process of collapsing down to form a cluster. Um, so again, supporting the idea perhaps that stars form and then begin to collapse down to form, form clusters. Whether you believe their exact correlation is, is up to you, but I think it's an interesting idea worthy of exploration. Um, now, obviously, once we have proper motions from Gaia, we will be able to get plane of the sky motions, and we've got plane of the sky positions, and we can start to look at how things are moving uh, in those dimensions. What I'd actually like to talk about today is that you can actually get very precise proper motions from existing data um, from telescope archives around the world. And that's come down to the fact that most wide field instruments on telescopes around the world came online sometime in the 1990s, and most of those observatories have been very good at storing their data in a readily and still accessible format, um, making it available freely, um, and that you can obtain it and all the necessary calibration data um, from their archives. And so we've done this for a region that I'm going to be talking about today, um, using data that spans 15 years, um, and that leads to approximately a, a sub milliarc second per year precision, which is about an order of magnitude better than Hipparchos. The region in question that I'm going to be talking about is Cygnus OB2. Now, OB associations are low-density groups of stars that we see on the sky. They're believed to be gravitationally unbound because they're relatively low density, and the common explanation for them is that they are the expanded remnants of star clusters. Now, while the vast majority of young stars are found in clusters, by an age of about 10 million years, only about 10% of stars seem to be in clusters, and the remaining 90% are effectively dispersed into the gravitational field and are populating galaxies. The common mechanism proposed for this is a process called residual gas expulsion. And the idea behind this is that stars are born within a molecular cloud, and therefore the gravitational potential that can hold a cluster of stars together is due to both the stars and the gas. Now, star formation is a relatively inefficient process. Only about 5 to 10% of the mass of a molecular cloud goes into the stars, and therefore the majority of the gravitational potential that's holding a system together actually comes from the gas. Now, we know that once stars are a couple of million years old, they are rapidly dispersing the material from their environment, blowing away the molecular material, ionizing it, and supernova are, are surely um, injecting vast amounts of energy. By taking away that material and the gravitational potential that comes with it, they're effectively sowing the seeds for their own destruction. And the idea is that a star cluster will rapidly become super virial, and there won't be a sufficient potential to hold the cluster together. It will then expand it will be briefly visible as a low-density group of stars on the plane of the sky, such as an OB association, and then it will disperse into the galactic field, um, and we won't be able to see it again. So we're after OB associations to target, uh, to, to address this idea. We're going after Cygnus OB2 because it's about three to five million years old. That's a good age. It's outside of its molecular cloud, yet it's still young enough that it's not dispersed too much into the galactic, plane, into the galactic disk. The mass of Cygnus OB2 is believed to be about 2 to 4 times 10 to the 4 solar masses. And that's comparable to the most massive star clusters we see in our galaxy. 
So we've got a, you know, a system here that could have originally been a very dense, compact, massive star cluster, and we're certainly going to be able to pick out enough members to do a decent kinematic study. There's about 65 O-type stars known in Cygnus OB2, of which two have masses of up to about 100 solar masses. So we've got really a fully sampled initial mass function here, no different from that which we'd see in many other star clusters. What we're doing is we're attempting to obtain radial velocities and proper motions, and I'm going to be mainly talking about proper motions today, for 4,000 members of Cygnus OB2. These objects here. Now the red and the orange points are O and B type stars, which are spectroscopically known. They've come from various spectroscopic surveys um, over the last couple of decades. And the blue crosses are X-ray selected young stars. And the reason why we use X-rays is because young stars are very X-ray bright, and so it's a very efficient mechanism to identify young stars through X-ray imaging. Those are these blue crosses shown here. I'm going to be talking mainly about data from the central region, which has been the most well studied, but we are extending this survey to the entire area. The proper motion data that we've got, like I said, comes from 15 years of images from 10 different telescopes around the world. In total, 2,500 unique observations, uh, 11 instruments, I think, 10 telescopes. Um, all of these have been gathered from telescope archives around the world. Effectively, I'm not going to go into details, but we solve the astrometric solution for each individual image, combine them to produce a global astrometric solution, and then we have um, position as a function of time for our target, typically between 100 and 150 measurements of position over the 15-year baseline for the objects that we're interested in. This leaves us with a proper motion if we fit position against time, and, and from that we effectively have our kinematic measurements. This is the sort of precision we're able to obtain. This is proper motion uncertainty in milli arc seconds per year as a function of magnitude, color-coded by the baseline of the observations. As you'd imagine, brighter sources typically have more precise proper motions, and longer baselines also give us more precise proper motions. Now, uh, the first Gaia data that will come out this summer will be anything brighter, effectively, than 12th magnitude. So, unfortunately, there won't be any overlap for us at that point. The eventual Gaia data will go to about 20th magnitude in the V-band, which is about 18th magnitude in the I-band. So, Gaia will certainly beat us for all of this by about two orders of magnitude. We're about an order of magnitude better than, than what Hipparchos would be able to do, but Gaia will certainly beat us. Anything fainter than this, Gaia won't even see. So we're already doing better than Gaia in these three or four magnitudes. And in fact, we don't think we'll be beaten until about 2025, when LSST will start producing proper motions. And even then, their precision is broadly going to be the same as us at the end. So I think it's interesting to note that you can actually obtain proper motions for stars in many star forming regions and star clusters using existing data that is better than Gaia and is as good as anything that we've got planned in the next 10 years. Um, these are our velocity dispersions, which is what happens when you plot velocity up uh, and bin it up. Um, what we've got here is velocity dispersions in the two dimensions. These come out at about 13 and 9 kilometers per second. That's in agreement with what's known from the massive stars from a spectroscopic study. That's about 8 kilometers per second. You'll note that these three values are all slightly different, suggesting that we have a non-isotropic velocity dispersion, probably indicating that the system is not dynamically relaxed and hasn't had time to obtain equipartition in terms of its energy distribution. I'll come back to that in a moment. If you put these three velocities together, you can estimate the virial mass of the system, the mass that would be needed to hold this group of stars together, and that comes out at about 9 times 10 to the 5 solar masses. Unsurprising, I think, that that's about an order of magnitude larger than the stellar mass, telling us the system is unbound, but it's an OB association. We kind of expected that. The really nice thing you can do about proper motions, and the thing that you're going to see a lot of in the next 5 or 10 years with Gaia data, is you can plot the motions of stars up on the plane of the sky, and you can see what's really happening. So what I've done is, I've done this for 750 members of SIG-OB2 in the centre of the association. I've excluded anything moving more than 3 sigma away from the median velocity in each dimension, because those are typically ejected stars, or perhaps a few line of sight contaminants and they don't really tell you about the structure that's going on. Blue stars is anything from B spectral type down to lower mass stars, maybe down to 0.5 solar masses, and the O type stars, of which there's 30 in this field of view, are shown in red, and you can see them dotted around there. What we can do with proper motions is we can begin to separate them into their constituent components along various different coordinate systems. This is, for example, the radial component of the proper motion. Uh, this is about 60% of the total kinetic energy is in the radial direction. Now, one of the things we wanted to test was whether Cygnus OB2 is an expanded star cluster. If it was, we'd expect predominantly radial motions. Outward radial motions, if the group of stars had originally been compact, 
like a star cluster, and had since expanded. In which case, we'd expect the majority of motions to be in the form of expansion. What we find is that the radial component of the proper motion is almost divided equally between expansion and contraction. You see them colour-coded here, suggesting there's no preference for an expansion, <coughs> an expansive motion um, of this OB association. So, Cygnus OB2 is not expanding in terms, of its, in terms of a cohesive motion. It's not an expanded star cluster, therefore. And cluster disruption mechanisms, such as residual gas expulsion, have presumably not been at work in unbinding this system. Now, we think we can probably rule out that this was both a single star cluster and probably that it was three or four single star clusters. If you start to ask whether this was originally ten even smaller star clusters, it's kind of harder to address that with the data we have, but we're going to be looking into that in more detail in the future. The really exciting thing that I think we found with these proper motions is what we call kinematic substructure. And what I'm doing here is I'm colour coding all those proper motion vectors by the position angle that the, star is, the, the star's motion is in, uh, according to this colour wheel up here. And what you can begin to see is that stars in the same area of the sky are typically moving in the same direction. For example, there's this little group here. You can see they're all pretty much colour-coded purple because they're all moving in this direction. There's a group here in orange. All of these are moving towards the south. In fact, if you pick a star at random and look at its na nearest neighbour, you'll probably see that it's moving in a very similar direction. Got two little friends, friends here moving in a very similar direction. Little group in here, blue. Little few green ones up there together. We've tried to quantify this. We've tried to measure the significance of this. For example, uh, using measurements of uh, spatial correlation functions, such as Moran's eye test. And it tells us that there is significant kinematic substructure here, that the proper motions are correlated with the spatial positions to a significance of 12 sigma, which is uh, quite overwhelming. Um, what this means in terms of how this region formed, well, these individual groups appear to be close, if not in, viral equilibrium. Now, we're really getting down to measuring some quite specific uh, virial um, uh, ratios here. So we're not entirely at a level where we can say this with a huge amount of confidence because we're at the level of our own prop motion uncertainties. Um, but it does appear that they are very close or in viral equilibrium. And in some ways, that's kind of what you'd expect because these groups of stars are probably three to five million years old. If these were unbound, we wouldn't expect them to see them moving together at this point. The typical velocity dispersion of a young group of stars of this sort of scale is maybe 0.5 or 1 kilometer per second. That's the equivalent of about one parsec per mega year. So in five mega years, they should have moved five parsecs, which means you'd expect these groups to be about this big, but they're not. They're more like this big. And we think that means that these, are, these groups are very close to being in equilibrium. That means they're potentially going to be in a gravitationally bound state for a very long period of time. That means that these could be an indication of the origin of things like moving groups that we see in the local solar neighbourhood, and for example, things like open clusters. They're a little smaller than some of the ones we might know of, but it's possible that this is sort of origin of those systems. What this substructure also means is that this group of stars cannot be dynamically evolved. By dynamically evolved, I mean mixed. I mean the group of stars are interacted with each other. But if you were to take this little group of stars here and mix them with this little group of stars here, they wouldn't come out of the process moving within the same directions that they're currently moving in. They'd have dispersed. They'd have interacted. They might have mixed to form a single group. They might have just dispersed the groups entirely. So that tells us this is not a dynamically evolved group of stars. <laughs> Star clusters typically are dynamically evolved. This is not a dynamically evolved group. So again, I think that's evidence that this is not an expanded star cluster. One of the things that is potentially the most interesting is that within these moving groups, as I showed earlier, there are O-type stars, including two with masses of 100 solar masses. And these groups, we've estimated, are, have total masses of somewhere between 200 and 400 solar masses. And that means that in a group of stars, which hasn't interacted with much else in its environment, and which is perhaps only three, four hundred solar masses, there have been stars of up to a hundred solar masses that have formed. Now, if you believe that the initial mass function is sampled purely stochastically, then that's fine. But many people believe, for example, that there is a limit on the mass of the most massive star that you can form within a group that is dependent on the mass of the group. For example, people say, if you have 10,000 solar masses of material, you can't form a star more massive than a hundred solar masses. If you have 500 solar masses of material, you won't form anything more massive than 10 or 20 solar masses. What we're seeing here is that while that correlation exists on the larger scale, which could equally be due just to purely stochastic sampling, it doesn't exist on the smaller scale. Groups in here 
have a very large fraction of their mass sometimes in a single star. And that's, I think, what we'd expect if the IMF was purely stochastically sampled. Um, so I think that's potentially a very interesting result, um, and it'd be really nice to see if, if more comes out of that, um, and perhaps with Gaia data. Before I finish, I'd just like to say if you'd like to know any more, um, and you fancy picking up your recent copy of Astronomy and Geophysics, you'll find in there um, a summary of a meeting we had, an ARIA special discussion meeting about a year ago, um, which has summarised some recent results in this area, uh, and I encourage you to have a look at that if you'd like to know more. Um, and I'll just finish with my conclusions, which are basically that there is a revolution coming in kinematic data quality and quantity. This is coming from multi-object spectroscopic surveys and proper motions from Gaia. And this is really going to revolutionise, revolutionise our view of star formation and star clusters. As an example, I've given our prop motion study of Cygnus OV2, uh, which shows that it has no radial expansion pattern, <coughs> suggesting it's probably not an expanded star cluster, and it shows considerable kinematic substructure suggesting the group is not dynamically evolved. And all that means for the origin of OV associations and high-mass star formation is, I think, worthy of uh, much discussion. Thank you very much for listening. So we do have time for a few questions. So while we're located people on the floor, I've just got one initial one. So Guy does have radio velocity capability. Is that not any use for you? Is it, for, is it because the stars are too bright? Uh, it's actually because our stars are mostly too faint. Gaia's right. radio velocities will go out only to 16th magnitude in the B-band, and even then they'll only reach about 5 or 10 kilometres per second. So it's going to be used for, I think, for bulk galactic archaeology kinematics, but not for star cluster studies. Okay, there's a question down there. You wait for the microphone, please. Uh, I may have missed this, but have you any uh, radio velocity information on this different... <coughs> Groups you have in the proper motion. We do. Um, we have. We should end up with radial velocities for all those stars for which we have proper motions. But because we want to make sure we haven't uh, contaminated our sample with binaries, we are taking multiple epochs of radial velocities so that we can identify those objects and remove them. And so that's building up to quite a lot of data that we've got to reduce. Miles, just um, should be hopefully done this time next year or in two years. Awesome. Do you think that our sun was made in company with a lot of other uh, much more massive stars <coughs> and it's been ejected from the group or how, where would you put our sun in, in times of, uh, of its origin? Put it that way. It's, birth, it's that cluster? birth cluster. That's, a, that's an area I probably can't give you an educated answer other than to say that there has been a lot of work to look for telltale signs. For example, uh, assessing what sort of environment the sun could have been born in based upon the fact that all the planets still orbit uh, within a plane, um, that some of them have, um, well, for example, that Pluto has um, uh, an eccentricity to its orbit. And there's also some evidence in isotopes in meteorites that suggest the sun was at some point during the formation of the um, solar system was not too far from a supernova. How you put all that together to, to identify the birth side of the sun um, is for people smarter than I. Any other questions? Okay, I guess not. So let's uh, thank Nick again and... Uh...